Good evening. I'm Mabel Wilson, and I'm the director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies, as well as a professor in our newly formed Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies here at Columbia. I am speaking this evening on the traditional land and unceded territory of the Muncie Lenape, and I pay respect to their diaspora and honor the past, present, and future presence of the Lenape on their homeland. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's talk, Passing Fantasies at the Borders of Race and Belonging in African American Art, by Dr. Tobias Wufford, Associate Professor of Art History at Virginia Commonwealth University. This is our third event this semester, and there are more exciting ones to follow. So please check our website for more information on future topics and dates. Now, in his research, Dr. Wolford explores the meaning of globalization and identity in the art of the African diaspora since the 1950s. His work also explores concepts of diversity and multiculturalism in the art of the United States. To this effect, he has written on the multifaceted role of Africa in contemporary African American art, analyzing how Africa is invoked and interpreted within the context of shifting artistic, political, arti just shifting artistic and political movements in the United States. And on this topic, he has a forthcoming book, Visualizing Diaspora, Africa in African American Art, and we're eager for its publication. His research has been supported um, uh, by fellowships from the Center for Advanced Study in Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art, the Mellon Post Doctoral Program at John Hopkins University, and he is this academic year a fellow at the Getty Research Institute. He was also a Terra Foundation um, postdoc fellow in American art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in Washington, DC. His research influences his courses that he teaches exploring African American art and visual culture, art of the African diaspora and American art. Moderating the question and answer for tonight's talk will be my colleague, Dr. Kelly Jones, who is the Hans Hoffman Professor of Modern Art and the Chair of African American and African Diaspora Studies here at Columbia University. Dr. Jones's accomplishments are many, including being named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow, a Fellow of the Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a Fellow to the Hutchins Center for African American, for African and African American Research at Harvard University. And for many publications of note, two books published by Duke University are I Minded, Living with Writing in Contemporary Art of 2011, and South of Pico, African American Artists in Los Angeles in the 1960s and 70s, uh, published in 2017, which was named the best art book of 2017 in the New York Times. And I believe Dr. Wofford's work will be in dialogue in part with this, this wonderful text. Her exhibition, Now Dig This, Art in Black Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980 at the Hammer Museum Los Angeles, as well as PS1 here in New York, was named one of the best exhibitions of 2011 and 2012 by Art Forum. And so now I'm pleased to turn it over to um, Dr. Tobias Woodfer, who will, Woofer, who will share with us um, uh, some of his new work. Um, Tobias? Hello. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mabel, for that kind introduction and to both um, you and Kelly for this invitation, this wonderful invitation to share some of my research. So hopefully everyone can, can see this. So <clears throat> this is uh, my presentation. Um, I should begin, however, with a caveat that much of what I'm presenting today is still quite new to me. I'm not trained as a scholar of the 19th century or of landscape painting. In truth, much of my work has been focused on African-American artists since the mid 20th century who engage with Africa in their work. 
In these instances, I have used theories of diaspora to describe the multifaceted role Africa plays in delineating and giving form to Black identities in the United States, and how collective memory and ideas of community can be retained and invented through this engagement with Africa. This research, in effect, has been largely engaged with the ways in which discourses of difference have functioned in our multicultural nation, how African Americans as a diasporic community create and maintain notions of their particular difference through their artistic expressions. But there is another side to the functions of diaspora if we consider diaspora to be the movement of, or circulation of peoples into new geographies. There is the concept of assimilation or the denial of difference with the new communities uh, which the diaspora, in which the diaspora finds itself. Now, the concept of assimilation in African-American history and in art um, is multifaceted and complex. The most extreme and perhaps fraught aspect of this notion um, is the notion of passing as white. Passing has never been available to all people of African descent, but it highlights both the notion of race as a performative, performative and iterative uh, production, as well as the strangeness of the lines that have historically defined race in the United States uh, in particular. In doing so, the notion of passing also begins to present compelling challenges in the narration of African-American art. Oops, sorry. Um, <clears throat> this, is in, this in part has brought me to the 19th century artist Grafton Tyler Brown, uh, who I wish to discuss today and who is pictured um, on the right. Um, he joins several artists of the 19th century who have been foundational early figures in African-American art history, an artist who I regularly teach in my survey courses of African-American art and American art, including the portraitist Joshua Johnston, who, um, whose advertisement I have here on the, on the left, yet whose um, image we have, we have no extant image of, and uh, the landscape artist uh, Robert S. Duncanson. Each of these artists are known to have been at least of partial African heritage, um, satisfying the one drop rule that has legally and culturally defined understandings of blackness in the United States. Yet each has also been suspected or accused of having passed as white in one way or another. And the relationship between their racial identities and their art have presented compelling challenges for art historians. Consider, for example, Robert Duncanson's famous work, The Lotus Eaters. This incredible landscape painted at the height of Duncan's artistic powers is based on Alfred Lord Tennyson's 1832 epic poem, The Lotus Eaters, which narrates um, the story of a group of mariners who travel on uh, to a distant island and eat lotus blossoms thus being lulled into an altered state where they become uh, isolated from the world and shed their worldly cares. Duncanson's Lotus Eaters reflects his engagement with contemporaries such as those of the Hudson River School, including Frederick Edwin Church's uh, South American landscapes, um, such as um, Heart of the Andes from 1859, which toured to much acclaim to Cincinnati where Duncanson might have seen it. Yet in reading the work against Duncanson's uh, racial background, the work raises some tensions in the question of race um, and reading it into the history of African American art. Now Duncanson uh, never, or Duncanson's racial identity was never much of a mystery for, uh, for most of the audiences. Um, in fact, he was very often referred to in contemporary media and reviews as uh, by his African heritage, which usually described him as Negro or occasionally as an admixture, um, as in the case of one 
this particular uh, 1866 mention uh, from the Galveston paper Flake's Bulletin, which describes him as a bright octoroon. And if you see in this, what, what I particularly like about this clipping is that it includes a, a summary of an, uh, Duncanson's uh, display and presence in um, London, his success uh, with the Duchess of Sutherland and where Tennyson actually sees the picture of the Lotus Eaters. Um, and that uh, first exchange uh, describes him as a Negro painter. And then the uh, response that the flake has added to this is that he's not a Negro in the ordinary term, but here in quotes, like a bright octoroon. Uh, this Galveston paper thus suggests not only that the racial identity, identity of Duncanson was known, but also that it was something discussed, debated, and unpacked. Yet it is interesting that one of his art, out of his sons, uh, his very own sons, Reuben, seemed to have accused him of trying to pass as white. This can be gleaned from a letter from Duncanson refuting the charge in strong terms and summarizing, quote, I have no color on the brain. All I have is paint on the brain. And later I care not for color. Love is my principle. Order is the basis. Progress is the end, unquote. Thus, despite the, dis uh, the debate about the legibility of Duncanson's identity extends to his work in many ways, especially in the 20th century writing of African art history, African-American art history, excuse me. For Duncanson, like other artists dis uh, discussed today, worked within a European or Euro-American canon, largely for white uh, patrons and to the tastes and aesthetics established by and for largely white audiences and critics. Uh, beyond his commissions by abolitionist patrons, and one famous example of a work referencing Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle, John, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Duncanson's work is quite indistinguishable from the other American artists in terms of race. Uh, if we return to Duncanson's Lotus Eaters, we begin to see some of the challenges it presents as an expression for racial belonging. Scholars from our, uh, scholars from early writers of African-American art history, including Alan Locke, Cedric Dover, and James Porter, to more recent scholars have variously grappled with how much the artist's Black identity can be read into the work or others of Duncanson's, uh, this work or others of Duncanson's oeuvre. For example, in 1994, David Lubin wrote that the canvas is, quote, perhaps the fullest reflection on passing, paradise, and racial origins, um, end quote. Uh, Sharon um, Patton's excellent 1998 survey of African-American art suggests the possibility that the Lotus Eaters uh, were a reflection on the condition of the US uh, at the onset of the Civil War. She wrote, quote, the South had ceded from the Republic in 1860 and a political economic crisis loomed over the immediate horizon. Duncanson's seductive inhabitants are dark skinned and the men drugged by Lotus languishing in the tropical landscape represent African-American slaves and the indolent South, end quote. But when confronted with the canvas and uh, such readings, they begin to test credulity uh, in a ways that are both enticing and discomforting. As Margaret Rose uh, Vendres has sum summarized in 2001, quote, to interpret Duncanson's landscape, moreover, is to uh, recognize the many ways in which they, in which both they and Duncanson have been misread over time, end quote. Here, I'd like to offer my own misreading as a way to um, get started uh, for the land of the lotus eaters. Um, what if we consider the lotus eating intended, um, excuse me, what if we consider the lotus eating as a, a term for in terms of blackness and passing? I don't mean to suggest that Duncanson intended this analogy, but the story of traveling to far off lands and being lulled into a forgetting of home and um, in an idyllic landscape 
suggest some compelling parallels to the movement of Black artists in the 19th century, as well as the sometimes tenuous relationship uh, uh, and draw of the Black identity and communities that each of these artists felt. The Lotus Eaters helped me to think about the mutability of race in the discourse of identification among these artists in the 19th century. In this sense, the case of Grafton Tyler Brown has a lot of interesting parallels. Like the Lotus Eaters, Brown wandered to far off borders, uh, the young state of California shortly after the gold rush. And in, his lim in this liminal space, he redefined himself repeatedly. In what follows, I will discuss Brown and his history of passing as white in the American West. To do this, I will first discuss the shifting notions of blackness that took place in California as it existed in the colonial frontiers of first the Spanish, then Mexican empires, and then as it was subsumed into the United States. I will then turn to Grafton Tyler Brown and consider his oeuvre as he mediated the making of American expansionism, as well as how this history comes to bear on his rendering of the frontier landscapes. Finally, I will conclude with some reflections on the act, uh, on what the act of making Brown's uh, race visible might mean for the practice of African American art history. When Brown was working in California, uh, he was very much uh, part of the mechanisms that colonized and established the United States uh, after having wrested it from uh, Mexico. And in some ways, this image of the um, mining company of a certificate of shares for stocks for a mining company suggests um, part of the ways in which uh, Brown was entangled in this um, expansionism, um, which will, I will um, explore a little bit more. But before uh, we explore Blount Brown's life, I would like to go back a bit uh, further into history of California under the Spanish and Mexican colonization. Because in many ways, Alta California, as it was known in, um, during the Spanish and Mexican rule, was always a space where people of African descent sought out their fortunes and reinvented themselves. It is often supposed that there were few people of African descent in California before the 1830s. In fact, while it is true that the colonizing population in California was gen generally sparse before the mid 19th century, people of African descent played important roles in California under Spanish and Mexican colonization. It's important to remember that Mexico City was the administrative center for the Spanish Empire in North America until it gained independence in the year um, 1821. And throughout that history, California was largely a somewhat distant colony. According to census records, at least 20% of the Spanish speaking settlers and soldiers in California in 1790 were of African or part African descent. Historian Jack D. Forbes has suggested that the Spanish efforts to control and colonize the indigenous populations required the participation of those willing to go um, to these far off pueblos and presidios. The people of, Af people of African descent arguably took it as an opportunity to rise socially and financially. One thing to keep in mind uh, is that race under the Spanish Empire was very different or very differently codified from the way in which it existed in the United States. The one drop understanding was the dominant discourse in the United States. This extended from the 1660s law in colonial California, or excuse me, colonial Virginia in 1660s that addressed the status of mixed race persons under the rule partus sequitur ventrum, which held that the status of any child followed his or her mother. This rule eventually became racialized so that even while uh, terms uh, were often used to describe various degrees of uh, racial mixture, uh, mulatto, quadroon, octoroon, et cetera, 
Such terms were ultimately descriptions of the same identity with access to the same set of rights legally and, um, and socially. The Spanish empire often had a more elaborate system of codification that included different kinds of mixings. Costa paintings from, uh, from colonial Mexico, such as the one here, describe the various degrees of mixture between indigenous Americans, Africans, and Europeans. Um, and as you can see this in this particular um, example, you have these Costa paintings always include like a, a parent a pair that will be of different races. Um, so on the top you have Espanol and, and India and together they make mestizo. Um, now this isn't to say that the racial hierarchy um, was less oppressive or anti-black, but that the expression of white supremacy in Casta uh, that the Casta paintings seek to elaborately codify established the Spanish at the pinnacle of a somewhat more complex a pyramid of identities. One in instructive aspect of this history is the racial mutability in California's uh, colonial pueblos. During this period, many settlers in the California pueblos took the opportunity over their lifetimes to rework their identities. As Forbes explored, uh, and here's um, an example of taken from his, his article um, early heritage of uh, early African heritage of California. And as Forbes, uh, as Forbes explored, responses to the eight, 1781 census and the 1790 census show that a number of individuals adjusted their in identities. Um, and so here we have um, particular people who reported one identity. Um, say Indian uh, for on the case of Pablo of Pablo Rodriguez in eighteen in seventeen eighty one and then he becomes um, coyote which is three quarters um, Indian in seventeen ninety one and as you go down you begin to see that uh, many of the people who change their racial identity um, in one way or another um, usually would do so uh, they would make a shift toward Espanol, right? So toward whiteness um, was uh, the com a common practice, one that is here in the Pueblo of Los Angeles, an example, but also happens in many of the other Pueblos, including or Presidios, including the Presidio of San Francisco. Um, Mexico gained its independence from Spain in 1821. Oh, excuse me. Um, The story of um, the Pico family is an example of the heights to which Mexicans of partial African an ancestry were able to rise. Pio Pico uh, of the famous street um, Pico in Los Angeles, and of course, which um, many of us know, uh, particularly in our history through um, the South of Pico book, um, was, um, was of mixed ancestry. His paternal grandparents were listed in the 1790 uh, census as mulata and mestizo, meaning of African ancestry and indigenous ancestry, and thus would have been uh, codified as black within the, the context of the United States. Um, and here, along with his uh, younger brother, Andres Pico, um, the, uh, the Picos, uh, grew in wealth and land um, during the, the independent era of Mexico, um, beginning in 1821, as the um, Pueblos began to um, sell a lot of the mission lands, um, different uh, Californios or the people of California were able to uh, bid for these lands and the Picos were a part of this. At 25, Pio Pico entered, the, and entered politics as a member of the Mexican Territorial Assembly. And in 1832, he was elected governor, and then again in 1845. Together, uh, Pio and Andres owned most of what is now Los Angeles County. Um, and both were principal resistors uh, of California's re California resistors to the U.S. incursion into California. 
but the inception of the US-Mexico War ended with the eventual ceding of California to the United States. And this coincided with the rapid change in the population of the territory as the gold rush brought hundreds of thousands of immigrants um, from the United States into California. Just to provide some uh, numbers, um, in 1846, so at the beginning of the, um, of the secession of California um, from Mexico, uh, California was home to a native population that was highly reduced uh, through the violence of colonization to about 100,000 and some 14,000 permanent uh, residents of, among the colonizers. Of these, perhaps 2,500 2, were foreigners or whites of non-Hispanic descent who immigrated from the United States uh, since 1840. But by 1850, some four years later, the Spanish-speaking Californians were only 15% of the non-Indian population. And by 1870, they were only 4%. Pico and the California way of life fundamentally changed. But I might suggest that the attitude toward racial mixing and the racial mutability established during spent a Spanish and Mexican rule presented a sub-narrative and perhaps a counter discourse to the intense legislation of race and anti-Black policies in the early stages of the state of California. Under the uh, shifting uh, population as Anglo-American dominance was established um, through the cold, gold rush in particular, um, in many ways, California, the state of California became an increasingly antagonistic place for African-Americans um, under US control. One of the important uh, debates in the establishment of the state was whether it would be a free state or a slave state. And the concept of a slave state was considered a threat to white labor but there was also a great deal of antagonism to the influx of free blacks. In 1849, the Constitutional Convention in California considered but did not carry an anti-black immigration clause um, in the state's constitution. Such legislation would have uh, prohibited the immigration of uh, free blacks uh, from in outside of California, but allowing those who were already in California to, um, to stay. Such legislation was not passed partially for fear of it stopping, of it stopping the actual passage of the state into um, the union during the congressional um, hearings. The anti-immigration bills though, were continued to be introduced in the California legislature following in the years following statehood, including uh, one in 1851, in 1857, and in 1858. Other anti-Black legislation included um, a law that stood for the first 13 years of statehood in which African-Americans could not testify against a white person in court and thus they could not carry out, um, they could you know, legally sue or have complaints against um, any white, uh, white people who might do them harm. In addition, a number of laws to segregate schools also existed and were uh, explicitly um, about keeping distinct the lines of uh, race. Thus, when Grafton Tyler Brown arrived in California at the young age of 17 in 1858, the same year that one of these um, anti-immigration laws was considered, he must have encountered a California that was simultaneously a space of great promise and a space of increasing restrictions for African-Americans. Um, a little bit about Brown. Brown was uh, born in 1841, close to um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He was the second of second child of free blacks, Thomas and Wil Wilhelmina Brown. And it is known that at least one of his siblings continued to identify as black throughout his, uh, throughout his life, according to the census in which he uh, participated. So when Brown, uh, Brown's arrival in California was first in the city of Sacramento, 
um, where he was employed as a waiter, one of uh, the typically menial jobs available to African Americans. During this time, uh, his time there, he appeared in city directories that identified him as a black porter in 1860 and as a colored steward in 1861. But according to art historian Robert Chandler, these were the last city directors to identify his race. He had already uh, moved out of Sacramento by the time the 1861 um, directory appeared and had headed for San Francisco um, in which he appeared in city directories simply as G.T. Brown. And the lack of designation of racial designation suggests that at least the assumption on the part of the directory recorder of Brown's whiteness. In San Francisco, Brown began to work for lithographer Charles Kutchel in, the, um, in 1861. He was tasked with not only working the lithography workshop, but also with traveling to different parts of the West to render scenes for clients. As Lizetta LaFall Collins described in her essay, Grafton Tyler Brown, Selling the Promise of the West, uh, works like this by Brown were part of uh, both the development of the West and his later landscapes um, uh, also become important parts of the movement to uh, preserve the West. If we take a moment to consider this particular work, and this is one of his first uh, works for uh, Kochel, um, we have here this Vir Virginia City and Nevada territory uh, rendered in 1861, drawn by Brown, and you have in, th in the center this uh, kind of wonderfully, um, this bird eye view of this mountain uh, town that is um, just being developed. Um, we see the way in which the silver boom town of Virginia City in Nevada uh, re was represented for customers, not only residents of the town, um, but also for pers perspective uh, fortune seekers and settlers who would be tempted to venture there. Uh, this particular format is one that is often replicated throughout, um, not just in Brown's uh, work and, uh, and lithography studio, but in many of the Western studios. Um, it stands somewhere between landscape and a schematic map. And these works, these images of the buildings along the outside um, also suggest uh, many of the different um, businesses and opportunities that existed for, um, for those interested in going to these places. In some ways, it, all, it presented a concept of a West um, on the verge, at least, of being tamed. It was a process of, of taming the West. Um, Brown uh, also rendered later this uh, this reimagining uh, of the Virginia city, um, again, from actual, from site, where you see the expansion and the kind of development that has happened in Virginia city um, over the, the three years between his first uh, rendition and the second rendition. Um, so you see the buildings are also have become uh, bigger and more robust. And the city here is um, taken from a further, um, a vantage point from further away in order to show its more um, sprawling um, attitude. And this uh, was one of the, the last works that uh, Grafton Tyler Brown did for, um, for Charles Kutchel, who passed away in uh, 1865. Um, Brown then began to work with the widow of Kutchel and uh, used some of the materials and um, stock that uh, the that the um, that Kutchel's uh, lithography business had to begin to have his own um, his own work. Um, so the, his own he started his own lithography business uh, called G T Brown and Company on 520 Clay Street. Here, um, or for this work, he uh, commissioned uh, advertisements um, and showed himself as an independent lithographer listing various works 
that he could uh, manage and produce on his own. Um, his clients included such famous uh, San Francisco businesses as uh, Wells Fargo, the Wells Fargo Mining Company, Levi Strauss, and the Ghirardelli Chocolate Company. Here in this slide, we have two examples of certificates that are um, in many ways just as important as his uh, schematic landscapes in their efforts to expand and, uh, and establish a presence in the American West. They needed to endow a sense of importance and stability for the companies um, through this uh, image of the certificate in order to get uh, uh, customers, whether in the West in San Francisco or often other parts of the nation and the world, to pour money into these speculative um, enterprises that were mining and uh, mining in these particular instances. And so in many ways, this kind of print uh, culture that is being produced by Brown and his, his company are feeding the expansion and um, establishment of the United States in, uh, in California and the rest of the West, other parts of the territories. While it is common for uh, scholars to look among the patrons of Black artists to assess the identity and engagement with the race among artists of this period, one does not find many um, Black or abolitionists uh, uh, patrons among uh, Brown's customers. As uh, LaFalle Collins describes, uh, there were some successful Black businesses in San Francisco, but Brown apparently did, did no business with them. Further, he was never listed among the Black businesses um, in San Francisco. He also created, um, in addition to the, the schematic landscapes and the certificates, he also created uh, more intimate images of properties. Um, his most famous being this book of views of San, um, uh, of San Mateo titled in, in Illustrated History of San Mateo published in 17 or in 1878. Examples such as this suggest the effort to um, establish a more civilized uh, West. The figures can be seen to us, um, the figures that we see in this in uh, carriages and, and um, other uh, examples um, travel around in fine carriages um, and they uh, represent their fine modern houses um, and were um, assumed to be um, the owners of these properties with uh, various ingenuities. And this particular image is one of my favorite. I um, tend to teach it when I'm um, teaching uh, in California in particular. And this on the left, we have this odd uh, uh, kind of construction that um, was created in order to quickly get the agricultural goods from, um, from this area in San Mateo into uh, onto ships. And so they've constructed this chute that would go off of the cliffs of, of, the, um, of the shoreline into the boats. It was actually a complete failure and didn't actually work. Um, but the idea of representing it began to show uh, the kind of innovation um, that California was associated with. Uh, examples such as these suggest the efforts to establish a civilized West um, and the figures, oh, sorry. Um, here we have uh, another example of uh, this work where Grafton uh, Tyler Brown has represented the ironclad mine. Um, here we have in the foreground more representations of, of people um, mixing together both this industrial uh, attitude that you see in the schematic landscapes uh, oriented toward businesses, and then also the, uh, those oriented toward um, individuals who want to have themselves represented. Now, his partial Afri African African ancestry was um, not entirely unknown, however, during his period as a lithographer. An 1870 census taker recorded Brown as mulatto, and um, an 1870 profile of Brown by a credit agency, R.G. Dunn and Company, um, uh, described Brown as 
a quadroon, meaning a person of one quarter African descent. Thus, um, it is a conundrum as far as uh, we can tell uh, to, to see the extent to which Brown spent most of his day-to-day -day life passing um, during his time as a lithographer. This question raises one important aspect of the dynamics of passing, one that illustrate that is illustrated in some ways in the 1929 Harlem Renaissance era novel Passing by Nella Larson. In some contexts, an individual may pass as white completely in all aspects of their lives, constructing an alternative or revised personal history and lineage, as the character Claire Kendry does in, L in Larson's no novel. In other contexts, passing may be a passive silence, one that allows an individual's racial ambigu ambiguity to play on the viewer's perceptions in contexts where segregation of the segregation of space is assumed. Such silences can be an easy veil over the perceptions of difference um, that are especially uh, arbitrary. So we might imagine a uh, that Brown often used silence as a way to mediate um, San Francisco uh, as, a, as a businessman and as a, um, as a um, producer of images and also partially part of why he was, um, would travel um, ab abroad in a lot of ways. Yet passing might have been a necessity for Brown when uh, possible in San Francisco um, in the late uh, 1870s and early 1880s, San Francisco became increasingly ra racist and xenophobic. The era saw a number of restrictions in labor for Black and Asian Americans. In uh, the case of printers, uh, for example, the printers union enacted a ban on hiring or training Black typographers. Uh, so something that would uh, directly affect um, uh, Grafton Tyler Brown. Brown sold his lithography business in 1879 to W.T. Galloway, though he continued to work uh, as an artist for Galloway, producing um, images such as this mine. So this is kind of in, in between his uh, transition. Um, instead, uh, Brown increasingly dedicated his energies to travel. He joined a survey expedition uh, to the Pacific, Pacific Northwest in 1882 and eventually spent almost all of his time in this region. This wanderlust um, could be part of Brown's uh, traveling spirit, a, something that is described in a reissue of the San Mateo um, history book. It describes his traveling as something that is a part of his um, his identity and his desires. But as LaFall Collins has pointed out, it was not uncommon for free Blacks to travel in order to avoid the degradations of racism um, when one settles into one place. For someone like Brown, whose identity was ambiguous, perhaps becoming a stranger in new lands was an easier um, place for artistic advancement. It is during this period that Brown began to move to easel painting. And in some ways this reflects both um, the waning profitability of the kinds of landscapes that Brown produced as a lithographer as the West grew increasingly settled and the industries of mining uh, began to wane in importance. Um, in 1883, Brown set up a painting studio in Victoria, uh, British Columbia, where he also uh, used a similar business, where he also used his similar business acumen, taking out ads um, to alert potential customers to his services and printing stationery. And here you can see this, uh, this photograph of Brown that is one of the, um, one of the few that, um, that exist. And you can see that this is very much a staging of himself as a kind of um, gentleman artist that, uh, that is um, part of this new identity in 1883. His paintings, um, in examples such as this Cascade Cliffs, Columbia River, suggest the roots of his work as a lithographer, um, but they present a new dynam 
new dynamism allowed by the painting as a medium. In this particular subject, we see in the foreground uh, a railroad that suggests um, the relationship between the uh, innovation and the um, conquering of the West and its um, still expansive wilderness. In their survey of African-American art, uh, Romare Bearden and, Bearden and Henderson um, somewhat derisively wrote that Brown could not find a focal point in his compositions because of his draftsman training. And so here in a lot of these different um, compositions that uh, Brown was creating at the, at the time, you have a, a kind of evenness of, of um, the composition that at least for Bearden was not, um, was not artistically ideal. Yet uh, the compositions felt fit well within the general landscape movement of the Pacific Northwest. Another um, excellent example is this um, view of the Lower Falls, uh, Grand Canyon of, the, of Yellowstone in 1890 that is currently at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And uh, works like this suggest also the transition in some ways um, in American landscape generally from the uh, conquer the West to the preserve the uh, wilderness. Um, and so Brown in his, and later in his painting career began to represent uh, more of these sites like Yellowstone that were sites of um, interest in preserving um, the wild um, landscape. And so in a lot of ways, he fits very neatly within this history of uh, of American landscape painting. Um, in the 1890s, Brown eventually moved to St. Paul, Minnesota and married a French wife. In St. Paul, Brown worked in uh, the Office of Civil Engineers. His racial identity while in St. Paul is perhaps where he was uh, passing the most. Robert Chandler described how the artist was either elusive about his racial background and census um, or refused to respond at all. And the last four censuses that include him, Brown was recorded as white. And according to LaFall Collins, Brown, when Brown died um, in, in 1918, his death certificate listed him as white. Thus he had um, from his life made this complete uh, passing over as, um, as the term in, um, in um, Larson's passing uh, is used for those who adopt completely a, a, a white identity. So what does the discipline of art history and particularly African-American uh, art history need to do to grapple with this story? I'm reminded of the many theories of diaspora um, that um, come to mind as one, in, one way in which to grapple with, uh, with these sorts of stories. For one, Brown's um, narrative reflects a notion of movement across geographical and political boundaries that just like Brown's identity shift continually. This reflects the ways in which the new context um, in which Brown found himself provided new possibilities as well as new limitations on his identity. I hope in the year to come while I'm at the, the Getty to see if I can discover uh, more of these different contexts in which Brown found himself um, as he followed his wanderlust. In another way, I'm reminded of the work of Krista Thompson, whose discussion of diaspora as a sidelong glance um, in, with which to reassess Western visuality um, is particularly informative. It would help to add to and nuance the expanding discourse about the ways in which American landscape and manifest destiny um, was a uh, worked together and nuance those understandings of, um, through the participation of various kinds of artists that um, would that traditionally sit outside of the American canon. But most important for me in thinking about Thompson's uh, discussion of the dynamics of this uh, is Thompson's discussion of the dynamics of visibility and invisibility. When uh, the artists and their identities become uh, visible, what sorts of 
uh, stories can be told. The goal here is not merely to make Brown uh, visible and intelligible or to claim him as the first black California artist, but to address the complex and indeed often fraught relation to visibility and intelligibility that appear in these works and in the, among these artists. To think through the fact of Brown as passing as white while being the first black uh, artist in California necessitates a reckoning of the ways in which being the first black California artist in the 19th century was oddly an impossibility. Uh, with that, I will end and thank you for your time and, and uh, attention. Thank you so much, Tobias. That was wonderful. And of course, um, you know, some of the people that I've, I've thought about as well. And I think we'll, I'll just jump in with my first couple of questions and um, we'll look to see when the questions start popping into the Q&A, please put your questions in the Q&A and we will then read them out um, to Tobias. So thanks for that wonderful talk. Um, you know, the West of course is something I was fascinated. I'm trying to get away from being fascinated <laughs> with it. So I'm glad okay. somebody else is, is jumping in. And that 19th century period, you know, is, is, is so fascinating. And of course, you know, I think what you describe uh, in the talk is the kind of power of, you know, the kind of Bay Area, the Northern California as the locus of power for Black people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then kind of Los Angeles eventually comes in um, to take over that. And, and also probably as you narrate, um, it's, it begins to happen when these kind of crackdowns are, are starting to happen at the turn of the 20th century, when all that kind of openness that is of course 50 years based on uh, basically imperialism and <laughs> taking land away from Mexico, you know, creates this open space. But I'm wondering, you know, if you've had an opportunity to think about, um, this idea of the West and artist generally, and you may be just at the beginning of this of this project, but you mentioned, you know, Duncanson, um, Brown, also J.P. Ball, all of these artists um, kind of move into the Pacific Northwest, Canada, move in and out of Canada at this mm -hmm. time. J.P. Ball, the photography of photographer of course, who's uh, talked about, uh, discussed in the book by Deborah Willis, uh, you know, goes to Seattle. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, about this, and, you know, I hadn't really thought about those artists particularly passing. We know that Ball was, you know, an abolitionist when he was in Cincinnati, also still considered part of the West at that time. Um, so I'm wondering if there's something about that that is that kind of fluidness uh, of it um, that you know is part of what happens here. Um, yeah. Yes. Definitely. I. You know. I. It is. This is like I. I said. Um. Like fairly. Fairly new. Um. Material for me. Um. I've been teaching it uh, in my surveys, but like to actually begin to, to grapple with all of the, the questions that students raise or, you know, that I have for, for myself. Um, now feels like the, the time that I'm going to be able to, um, to try and explore that. But I do think that there is something about the West that um, provides a kind of like I say, this loom, uh, like a kind of um, liminal space uh, where there is this possibility of, of redefining. I mean, and, but what's also quite interesting um, is that these spaces are also becoming increasingly like where, um, where race becomes very much codified and people are 
the the, the powers within the United States are um, are very much worried about um, black ascendancy um, in those in those kinds of spaces. And so I, I think I find that particularly interesting. And um, and I think that it also, for me, in a lot of ways, I think of the the different kinds of hybridity that uh, existed in these in these spaces, particularly in California, um, that might have been there already, that might have been um, accessible to some of the um, the new newly arrived black um, African Americans into the into those spaces. And I, I feel like I need to, to do a little bit more um, research. But in a lot of ways, this is why I began a little bit with the Lotus Eaters, because I felt like there is this, um, this possibility that maybe some people saw to go to these spaces and kind of um, be there and forget, you know what I mean? Um, and um, this also falls in line again with the the idea of um, of artists that, that choose to pass and how to incorporate them within the um, the discourse of of African American art history, um, which I think is kind of like a, a bit of a challenge, or has been a challenge for me. Um, and so this is part of me wanting to grapple with that as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think I would um, I would push it a little bit further and say, I mean, two things. One, it's a it's about working, right? That's one thing, right? right. Yeah. It's it's a way that people are able to work, and so right. they leave that fluidity open, um, whatever else is going on. Um, but but then it's not you know kind of unknown in some ways, right? Because you think of uh, the artists uh, or the people who use passing to leave slavery, for instance, the right. crafts uh, running a thousand miles to freedom, right? You know, they're passing, uh, Ellen Craft is passing as a, as a white man and her husband is passing as her servant to get out of slavery. You know, mm -hmm. so there's that. I mean, it is a, a, some kind of function of uh, to either live, to work um, along those lines. And then you have somebody kind of later, I'd say uh, an artist, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, who's working in the Harlem Renaissance era, but as um, then she, you know, was at Spelman for about a decade or so. But then when she leaves there, uh, it's when she begins to say that she's, you know, indigenous, she no longer wants to be a Negro because of what it, says about her getting work. Um, and, and I would, I would um, also link that with Saidi Hartman's, uh, mm. I just taught the article uh, <laughs> based on Wayward Lives or that Wayward Lives comes out of and how those women at that moment, you know, it's, you're leaving all the things that um, mark you as somebody who's a laborer. So I think this idea of the Lotus Eaters is something to explore. So I'm wondering if, you know, there's, there's something there, you know, that perhaps our idea of passing as what do we do with Black artists who want to use that as a tool becomes problematic for us as a teacher. Is it, is it our problem? I mean, maybe it's, it's our problem as opposed to the artists themselves. Yeah, I would, I, I totally agree. I think that in a lot of ways it is, it becomes of like what, what we want. This is me just being like self-reflective or, you know, like in, in a lot of ways, but I think in, in some ways it's like what we want from our African-American art history, you know, um, and, and then what is there, right? And it's often um, important to, to right, embrace those, those elements that, are actually really create a lot of really important informative dissonances with, um, with the expectations and the desires of the um, of the discipline um, and as someone who works within the discipline, um, and so I think that um, 
I think that you're you're right. And I think also I didn't incorporate it, but I've been thinking a little bit of like questions of fugitivity and that sort of thing um, in terms of of this this idea of passing. So I think that you're right, like Sadia Hartman and and others are, are really um, can be very informative for this project. Um, so yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And I yeah, it is, it becomes a lot of it has to do with what, you know, what different scholars over the course of African American, the writing of African American art history have wanted. And that's kind of what I find really interesting with all of the different ways in which the Lotus Eaters has been uh, misinterpreted as, um, as, um, her name just flew out of my head, but um, as one scholar said, you know, there, there's layers of misinterpretations and I'm like, I'm going to add my own misinterpretation. Let's talk about it this way. But I think <laughs> that there's, you know, like, I think that it's, it's inter that's an interesting aspect of, of what we do and what we're, we're doing um, that I want to both embrace, but also um, try to bear, bring to light these art, these artists and this history in a more like maybe dynamic way. Um, work still has to be done as far as this particular project, I, I'm sure, but um, yeah. No, it, it, it's, it sounds great. It's a great start, you know, in terms of opening up that mo that uh, concept of passing, um, what do we do with that? And, yeah. and what does it mean? And, you know, you mentioned, I love the fact that you mentioned uh, Krista's, uh, Krista Thompson's sidelong glance, which begins to unpack diaspora in that way as, as others have, um, you know, Brent Hayes Edwards, um, Lisson, all these right. yeah. people thinking about these kind of tensions in diaspora. And so I think passing becomes the thing that, you know, uh, gets sublimated also um, but interesting to see, you know, artists, um, you know, how it, how it reflects in art history as well as, as, as something, um, as a, some kind of mechanism uh, there right. as well. So absolutely. Um, I see Mabel jumping in. Hi, Mabel. Hi, I can't put questions in the Q&A. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Most co-host, whatever I can't use the Q and A, so oh. I just pop on and, and ask my question. But thank you, Tobias, for a really wonderful talk and and a really great provocation. And there are just so many questions that I have. Um, and I was trying to think: can I combine this into a question, or should it be just more of a comment? But I don't know if you're familiar um, with Adrian Brown's "The Black Skyscraper." No, I'm not. It's a really, it's a, it's a fascinating book. She is in um, English and Comp Lit at University of Chicago. Um, and the reason I think it's relevant is because she has a whole chapter on passing and the built environment. Oh. And what the book does is it looks at literature and it looks at the rep various representations of the skyscraper from Pulp Fiction to, you know, Du Bois, um, for instance. And one of the things she's interested in is the way in which the skyscraper as a form, particularly its facade, produced a kind of visuality and what she says is a racialized visuality of unease where the facade can't be read. You can't tell exactly you know, what, what is stable or what isn't stable. And so it becomes a potent metaphor, she says, in novels that deal with these, these questions of race and where bodies are, are positioned and how they're, they're read. So she talks about a kind of visuality that emerges because of the um, technological innovation within cities. But those lithographs made me wonder if one could also apply that to landscape and start to think about the way in which landscapes are being technologically transformed because those lithographs are very kind of bucolic impressors. And we know those landscapes were incredibly destructive, toxic, messy, disorderly, right? And I'm, and I'm wondering if there's something about a kind of visuality that might emerge out of thinking about the landscape in that way that could also tie into questions of the visuality of race. And, 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 and I think Adrian makes a really interesting um, theorization through literature um, about that. Great. 
Um, thanks for that. I'm definitely going to to um, to take a look at this because I I haven't um, I haven't read it, but I think I I believe I can see that what you're describing as far as this idea of being able to the in, uh, the illegibility of and mutability almost of like experiencing this edifice that you cannot take in all at the same time or something like I think that that. Um, yeah sounds sounds right um and yeah. in the, oh, oh go ahead oh i was just saying like in the nella larson book um it you know the very first scene is or where she engages with um uh, her friend that she's not seen for a long time they're on the top of a skyscraper skyscraper and then she falls out of one later on at the end so that's that's really fascinating i can't wait um to yeah it's a it's really smart and well researched, and she's she's looking at the literature and architecture at the same time, and also this kind of like distrust of these new facades and structures, yeah. right? In terms of what they do around the expectations, right, of what a building or a place or a city should be, um, and and so it's fascinating. The other book I was thinking of again around the, the shifting in visuality is Rebecca Solnit's *River of Shadows*, where she mm. does this really rich analysis of um, Moybridge. And the ways in which Moybridge, you know, went through, you know, those landscapes and photographs with these tech, technical, you know, with these cameras, with these apparatuses, right? And, and that also might might be um, a way of sort of thinking about these these landscapes as, you know, landscapes of white settler colonialism, resource extraction, right. you know. And it seems like these lithographs are presenting a much more picturesque view of it as opposed to what was really going on in the West at that time. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, it's interesting the extent to which they are, are cleaned up and, and presented. But I, I think that this is in a lot of ways part of the, the advertising um, branch of it, right? To make these scenes appealing. Um, and it, it's interesting that Brown seems particularly adept at it. Like the, you know, when he was working for um, for Charles Kutcher and then on his his own, like he was often the one that would travel around to these places and and render them from life, right? Um, but as you as you say, like very likely there uh, there's a lot of editing that he's doing as he's drawing these these scenes. Um, and I find that that is interesting. I've been thinking a lot in terms of landscape and his ability to move, you know, kind of freely, right? Um, as as an important, like racialized um, uh, ability that he's that he uses, um, and that in some ways that is like what um, the idea of of passing in this more passive. Um, action, right, where it's just like, I'm going to go stand over here. Most people don't expect um, a Black person to be here, so they won't literally see me, right, um, that kind of, of movement. But then I don't know if it, it's not exactly the same as what um, what is described in, in the literature around passing in, say, the Harlem Renaissance and, and others, where they're, you know, in very dense social con uh, contexts um, here here that it's somewhat different. Um, so I'd like to to do a little bit more of um, thinking and, and mining about uh, that history in, in the West and to think also about you know black cowboys and yeah you know, all you know the all of the different ways in which um, black uh, subjects were able to um, exist in the um, in the West, right? Um, you know, one more thought that came up was the beginning of Cheryl Harris's um, Whiteness as Property. And she tells them the story of her, her grandmother, I think, passing. And she talks about it in terms of mobility, the ability to move around the city in ways that if she were Black, she couldn't. Right. Um, you know, and again, there's something about being self-possessed, right, that whiteness allows, that then allows for a kind of mobility and a navigation of a world that's not possible. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there are two ways in which I've been thinking about this in terms of Grafton Tyler 
Brown. And one is this, this question of, of mobility. And the other in some ways um, is the idea of like whiteness as a kind of forgetting um, and passing as a kind of forget, passing as white as a kind of forgetting something that, um, you know, kind of, I'm going to erase this aspect of a, of a history and um, either by omission or by um, simply like not mentioning it anymore. Um, and this is something that I feel like the, certainly the people of the, the Pueblos of Los Angeles and, and San Francisco were literally doing, right? They're just like, well, I'm going to move a little bit in this direction, which is um, thought to be more desirable. But I mean, that's, this, this applies to African-Americans, but it also applies in a lot of ways to other white um, subjects whose identities would be um, kind of diasporic if they embraced, you know, their their Irishness or um, what have you. But if they, to achieve like a kind of whiteness in the American context, one has to kind of forget those particularities um, and those narratives of dispersal. Um, and so, so there, I think that the, for me, those are the two different elements. Like one is about a, a moving around and the other is about like a kind of, um, a kind of uh, erasure of the past, right? Um, that is in the way that I have been thinking about diaspora for most of the time is like opposite of what I um, think of as, as diasporic, um, mm. but is actually kind of the same or a part of the same, um, the other side of that coin in a way. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah I, I would also just think about it. I, I wrote a big note to myself it's a response to white supremacy. So I think there's something that is there about, you know, this kind of dyad between white supremacy and passing. What is that? Is it, is it, what kind of key does it unlock it? Does it, you know, how does it fit with that? And I think that's something that um, could be explored, explored further in that. And how does art and particularly painting, you know, lithography, painting, it's flat media, even, even if we look at somebody like Ball, but he, he's not passing per se, he's more like itinerant. Um, and then just one other comment is um, Nat Love, you know, the life and adventures of Nat Love, the black cowboy, 19th century black cowboy who um, writes his memoir, right, comes out in, in 1907 in LA and um, he basically is a self-liberated person um, when he's a child and then, you know, kind of goes to the South but then goes to the West and makes himself up. I bring that up because uh, Virginia City is one of his sites too. Oh, okay. So, Interesting. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so there's, there's something about these sites which are also a site of mixing, right? Mm -hmm. A site of where, you know, it's the frontier, quote unquote, where, where all sorts of people are. And then what, you know, so that's why I'm thinking, what is this passing? What is, is it, is it passive? You know, when we think about it, we think it's, it's forgetting, as you said, but there's, there's another thing there that I think is interesting to unlock, especially in these uh, sites traversed by different characters that, you know, either write down their stories in the case of Nat Love or are documented in these places. So it might be interesting to look at that as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting too to, or, you know, you, you make me think of the, the question of like silence, right? Like, is it passing or is it just that, you know, nobody noticed or you know like his identities right and I think that this is um becomes one of the the questions that um that becomes fascinating for me when perhaps an artist or even some you know other kinds of producers or you know culture makers um just don't talk about it then it becomes uh, almost as if it you know that uh, it didn't exist, you know what I mean? And so I think that there's this really fascinating aspect of 
um, the role of silence and the way in which we're telling like African-American art history in particular. And I think in terms of that, I think a little bit about, um, and I was thinking of putting that in this talk and I, but I didn't of um, Joshua Johnston um, and the kind of case of like whether he was um, black or not um, or of African descent or not and um, Romer Bearden in that wonderful, um, that great survey that um, that he wrote with Hen with um, Henderson was um, there. They they kind of come down on it like probably he wasn't right because there's no evidence. But the evidence is really because it's there's a lot of silence. But and eventually there was a um, you know the the record of his manumission manumission papers came mm. uh, were discovered and that was like the smoking gun. But before that, it was all simply rumors and and moments yeah. of silence. And so, so how to incorporate that into um, into the story, I think is, is really fascinating. When we have like examples where people are telling their stories, but then others like refusing to tell their stories becomes a really important, um, an important thing that is like, I, in some ways very difficult to reckon with, at least for me so far, um, but yeah. W one other thing, sorry. And then I'm gonna stop, Mabel's gonna Yeah, stop. no, let's okay, keep no. going. I <laughs> <Over>. <laughs> but, um, but the art always passed in some way, you know, the landscape art there, you know, uh, I, and I'm thinking about Edmonia Lewis too, because when I first yeah. started teaching that work, of course it's white marble and the figures are supposed to be black people, but they, they quote unquote, look European. And so yeah. students used to go crazy. They were like, this isn't black art. What are, what's so happening? You know, yeah. um, so I think the art always passed. And so that's yeah. an interesting thing to think of in this, in this moment. I mean, uh, and, and really unpack that. I'm, I'm excited as you can see about this, about yeah. this uh, project and, and what it can mean for really unpacking that concept. Yeah. Yeah, Edmonia Lewis is uh, is also like, it's a trip. And what's interesting is she was in San Francisco um, in I think 1873, she had an exhibition and actually went um, herself. So maybe they, did they pass, you know, did they cross paths? I wonder, you know, like, though it seems like he was fairly disengaged from the black community generally, though I don't know that she was necessarily going circulating in those or moving in those circles herself. So yeah, it's that's interesting. Um, she's I, I have the same experience with students being like, "What? Like, why is the white lady kneeling there?" And it's like, "Well, no, she's she's just been free." So yeah. Anyway, yeah, but her brother, her what was it? Her brother was also funding her, and he was the one. Yes. Yeah. who is one of the, you know, gold miners. And yeah, that, yeah, and totally. All that. Yeah. So it goes back to that same uh, locust in, yeah. in the West uh, yeah. for this. So it's, it's definitely um, something to look at. Yeah. Yeah, no, really, really wonderful talks. I mean, so much to sort of think about. And I've always wondered, you know, the complexities, particularly as, as, as African Americans move westward, right, and become a part of the settler project, right, and, you know, like, what does that mean? How do they identify? How, what, what are they, you know, how are they buying into, you know, Americanness that is also, you know, um, diminishing the presence of indigenous nations, right, in, in those right. territories, and, and I think that really needs to be critically examined, and I feel like, you know, this work is certainly going to probably touch upon some of those questions. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's a really yeah important part of it. I mean, it, and I feel that that also comes up even in the you know the Spanish and Mexican colonial times um, because a lot of them were like a lot of those settlers were there to suppress and control the indigenous populations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So thank you um, for this really probing examination of Grafton, who I'd heard of but didn't know much about, also Duncanson, um, and the complexities of, of race in a transforming American West. Um, so this was, was great.
I just want to give a special thanks to our co-sponsor, Columbia's Department of Art, History, and Archaeology. And once again, a thank you to our dedicated colleagues, Sean Mendoza and Sharon Harris, who are essential in shaping tonight's event. Um, I just want to say, um, coming up uh, in conversations on Tuesday, October 12th at 6.30, Dr. Devarian Baldwin, who will be in conversation with me about his new book, In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower, how universities are plundering our city. And also that same week on Thursday, October 14th, Uchina Itam uh, will be giving a lecture, Small, um, Smell Blood on Wengechi Mutu and Global Contemporary Art. And so for more information, please see our website, afamstudies.columbia.edu. And I wanna thank the audience for attending this evening's talk. Thank you.